Landscape Photography World, the podcast for everyone passionate about landscape photography. I'm Grant Swinburne and I'll be your host on this show talking to landscape photographers about their motivations, likes and dislikes. This time I'll be talking to Greg Witten. Greg is an award-winning landscape and adventure and travel photographer specialising in outdoor and mountain imagery from across the UK and beyond. In 2015, he was awarded the Light of the Land category win and the overall win to become Outdoor Photographer of the Year 2014. In 2016, he won the Live the Adventure category of the same competition. In 2015, Greg released his first quality photo book through Triple Kite Publishing entitled Mountainscape. Greg has lengthy experience in organising workshops and photo walks in the UK throughout the year. His general style is relaxed with an emphasis on ensuring clients enjoy their day as far as possible, experiencing the outdoors as much as improving their photographic technique in challenging environments. As a long time and very experienced hill walker, Greg has over many years organised and led groups of upwards of 40 people on long day walks, multi-day and week-long holidays. We talk about his early history with photography, how a recent accident has changed his life and philosophy, the future of photography, and the challenges facing photographers, and a whole lot more. I hope you enjoy the show. Hi, Greg. Welcome to Landscape Photography World. How are you going? Uh, Not too bad. Thanks for having me, Grant. Uh, Absolute pleasure. Thanks for taking the time. Um, Let's start with uh, who you are and... uh, why you do what you do. <laughs> um, okay, uh, well, I'm Greg Whitten. I'm a um, landscape photographer uh, from the UK. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, uh, I am what, what, I, what it says on the tin, basically. Um, I, I, shoot, uh, I shoot landscapes. <laughs> uh, more as a, I, you could say it's, at the moment, it's uh, as a living, but um, uh more on a sort of semi-professional basis as opposed to professional um so how did how did you get started and how how did you get started with photography in general but land what what drew you to landscapes uh okay how much time have you got (laughs) we've got Um, all the time in the world (laughs) <laughs> as long as I've got space um, in my heart, it's, it's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. Um, yeah, so, you know, I, I guess I came to it like probably a lot of um, hobby hobbyist photographers. Um, I, mean, I, I probably had my first camera um, probably when I was around 10 years old, mm-hmm. um, which was a Kodak uh, 110 format um, uh camera so you know I I enjoyed taking photos as a as a child um and then in my uh, early 20s I got into I got myself a um a film SLR camera uh which I enjoyed but I wasn't really um I I was still taking snaps I'd call them snaps um, I wasn't doing any processing of the film or anything like that. Um, it was just take it to the camera shop, get the film developed, see what came out the other end. Um, and, uh, and, and that probably went on for a couple of years. Um, and, uh, and then I lost complete, completely lost interest in it uh, shortly thereafter. And we're probably talking around the end of the 90s um, there. And uh, just through circumstance, um, in the uh, mid noughties I started getting into uh, hill walking with um, a bunch of friends. Uh, I was going to Snowdonia and the Lake District uh, a lot. Um, I joined a walking group. I was walking in the Peak District every weekend, um, and I just enjoyed the I just enjoyed the landscape and taking mm-hmm. photos. And uh, you know, I just had a little digital a digital uh, compact camera um, and I started playing around with uh, Picasa if you remember yep. Picasa um, which wasn't a particularly great uh, editing um, tool but it you know it, it served a purpose so I, I, I would say I did some um, very artistic processing um, with that um, but it but it piqued an interest and um, towards towards the end of around 2009 um, 
a friend in the walking group uh, was heavily into photography. He still is. Um, and he, he's one of these guys who would, um, you know, get up at uh, 3 a.m. because he'd seen the forecast yeah. um, for a great sunrise and half it across the country to be on top of the mountain for sunrise um, and then phone in sick um, when he was at the top. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, he he was selling his, he was upgrading his camera. Um, he had a uh, Canon 40D um, and he offered it to me for next to nothing really. Um, uh, so uh, so I bought that off him and, and the rest is kind of history there. That's, you know, that was the first sort of serious piece of um, uh, kit and digital processing was, um becoming easier mm -hmm. um from the point of view of accessibility yeah. um uh, the tools were quite powerful you didn't need a exceptionally um you know powerful computer or anything um and i just got into it got into it through that which is about the right same time as lightroom dropped as well so i started yeah. to um really get into my processing with lightroom um and it just developed it just developed from there and then the hill walking effectively gave way to um, walking with the purpose of taking photographs as opposed to just enjoying the outdoors. Um, but yeah, that's that's why the focus, I guess, uh, on the landscape. I was enjoying taking photos to um, show people, loved ones, whoever wanted to see them. You know, some some of the places that I was going um, and some of the things that I was seeing. Cool. So how did that sort of transpire that it then started to become semi-professional or, you know, in any way professional? Um, I, you know, I'd say that for a good, for a good five years, um, I was just getting more and more involved um, with photography and with the photography community in the UK that was really active on twitter at the time yeah. um so there was a lot of sharing of images there was a lot of um discussions um it was actually quite a rich time for um uh, photography in the uk i think you know landscape photography i'm talking about yeah. um uh in terms of social media and the impact of social media um so yeah, I'd say that over that period of time, that five years, my photography came on leaps and bounds just through just through sharing and um, critiquing and making friends and uh, meeting up with people to go on shoots and things like that. Um, and then, you know, I think as a as a hobbyist, you always heart. Well, most people would harbor a desire to somehow earn something from their pastime yeah. um, on, on the side. Um, so, you know, that there's the, there's the whole thing around, you know, entering competitions um, and uh, you, you see people offering workshops and then you see people offering work, you know, you, you develop to a point where, you know, you see people offering workshops who, who whose photography, you know, um, matches yours effectively or in some cases you know you you, you could consider that um, you're able to create better images or whatever yeah. um and and so you know those types of things start entering your mind of oh you know quite uh, uh, i could potentially start offering workshops etc um and and at around that time um is when i i also decided that i would go on a, a workshop with alex now yep. um uh, who is a very well-known um, photographer here in the UK. Um, and he was going to Iceland and I kind of found, I'd seen a lot of images from Iceland and he was going to do a, a hiking trail, very famous hiking trail uh, in uh, Iceland um, as a photography trip, backpacking with tents and everything. Um, so I went on that with him, uh, with a couple of other guys uh, and had a great time. Um, and on the very last night, he put us in a, a great spot where I got a, an image which effectively transformed my approach to how I look at photography and, okay. um, you know, potentially earn from it. Um, yeah, right. 
so that that was that 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 kick started um, uh, everything towards becoming um, a semi professional stroke professional photographer. <laughs> so was that where you sort of started to uh, you know see your your artistic approach sort of transcend from just you know the the, 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 and I'm not saying you were taking snapshots before then, but, you know, I, I guess, you know, taking a photo that was a fairly good representation of the scene in front of you to something that you considered to be artistic or was that something that was creeping into your photography before then? Um, it was it was starting to it was starting to creep in, or at least I was thinking about it. I tend to think about um the types of images that I want to create way in advance of actually creating them. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I was take, you know, having been involved in that, that social, um, that social circle uh, and um, being influenced by others and, you know, in a good way, um, I, I started to take an interest in um, photographers who I'd kind of known about but never really studied. Um, yep. The likes of the likes of um, uh, Joe Cornish, for example, um, is an obvious one. Um, David Ward, I really enjoyed his uh, mm -hmm. approach to um, landscape photography, um, and I start I started to think that I wanted to create um begin creating images that were uh, uh, you know equal uh in in their composition um in their vision um of of what those guys were capable of doing and putting out there and had been doing for, for you know 20 30 years um so that that started to shape how i approached um taking a photograph um from just a snapshot which might have been a pretty snapshot with some you know some epic light or whatever sure. um you know moving from that sort of grand vista towards a more intimate um, a more intimate approach to uh, yeah, right. photography. so are you finding that's what's motivating you and you know that that's that, that's more what you're chasing now in your photography that more intimate uh scene than the, the the grand vista sort of shot or, and how do, how do you see that i guess in terms of uh the evolution of where you started to where you are now um for for reasons beyond my control i've kind of like come full circle in a way um so for a good three or four years I, I you know I, I literally concentrated on one type of format which was um, um, a, you know a 5-4 uh, portrait um, approach uh, to to photography the you know one lens sat on my camera and and didn't move um, for a couple of years basically um, but that really made me focus on that type of image that I wanted to create. Um, so, yeah. you know, until it became second nature. Um, and, you know, I enjoy, I enjoy visiting what you would call honeypot locations um, and getting um, images that you could, you know, consider, you know, honeypot shot type shots, vistas. But I would try, always try and bring something sort of new or unseen to it so I'd always I'd always been looking for something that was a little different to um to the standard fare that you would that you would see from those uh those locations and then you know I it, it, it gets to a point I think if you're a photographer that 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 you only see in photographs you know you can be wherever you it, it annoys my wife it really does um <laughs> but when you know we'll be out in the car or you know we're out for a walk or whatever and i'm just constantly constantly looking at compositions as i'm walking along yep. um uh so you know just that that whole thought process um that you go through when you try and create a photograph um or a composition in a photograph um <laughs> basically just takes over your life i only see in photographs 
um so uh so yeah uh, I know the feeling. Uh, <laughs> yeah yeah um uh, so and and uh, and it would be well it annoys my wife because she'll be like you know we're out for a day or whatever and she's wanting me to take a photo of something and i'm like well that's not a good photograph so i won't take it but she's just looking for a memory yeah. <laughs> but i'm just like no it doesn't work it doesn't work it's unbalanced there are uh, anything in that corner it's just not going to work so you know she's oh, like oh, oh just take a photo <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so uh yeah. but yeah it's um uh it, it, it it's um in that period um sort of changed my focus away from from those uh just the the vistas um and then i had a i had a uh, an accident in um mid 2019 um which has meant to date that i've not really been able to get into the landscape um, okay. that i want to shoot so i've yeah. i've had to to revert back to a, a more distanced approach to um, um, photography using a much longer lens. Um, and that has naturally gravitated back towards some kind of vista, but with a, you know, I think with a more personal touch. Yeah. The best way okay. I, can describe it. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I was going to ask how, how you would describe your style and, you know, do well, do first, first off, do you feel that you have your own style or are you still searching for that? And uh, I guess, do you, how do you see that developing over time and how do you see how it has developed from where you sort of started to, I guess, make that artistic leap from just experiences to, to making art? to where you are now? Um, I, I wouldn't say I've got a, um, a style that is certainly not a unique style, but um, I think um, I think people who are aware of my photography, um, if they see a photo that's mine, um, they will almost certainly recognize it as one of mine yeah mm -hmm. um oh that must that, that looks like a greg shot you know yep. um so so from that point of view you know i i guess there is a style there it, it comes from um how i compose in part um but it also comes from how i process as well um so it, it does it does lead you down a, a typical um a, a certain style as it were and um, that does become recognizable sorry and i've lost you on audio there we go sorry, I, I put myself on mute i was, <laughs> I was just asking how, <laughs> how, how do you how do you uh feel that's developed from uh where you sort of first started out i mean my, most people start out imitating someone else or they you know um you you mentioned a couple of names there before um and i know you're not necessarily trying to replicate that exact shot but you know some of those stylistic elements end up contributing to to, to your own style how do you, how do you feel that's developed over time uh quite considerably i'd say um yeah i mean i would say that the, that there are certain photographers who have really influenced um influenced my uh, images would i say that i tried to copycat them no definitely not um i certainly don't look for copycat compositions um so you know you see I, I, i've got one or two in my portfolio but but you know if you see a photograph um from somewhere you're like oh i've got to get a shot of that you know um and so you travel and and get that exact shot uh, you know because somebody famous took it or something you want it your own yeah. that is not the, the, the iconic that, the iconic shots are right yeah and you know copy yeah and there are a, a problem yeah yeah, yeah I mean, I, don't, I don't have a problem with it it's not it's just something that i don't look to do um I, like i say i've got one or two um where i've actually looked at the original shot from somebody particularly famous who you know it could be one of their most well-known shots and i'll try and pick it apart and improve it um so that will be my aim if i go to the go to that location it's not to create a copycat shot it's actually to um, 
improve um, uh, what they saw um, in some way, shape or form. Um, whether I've been successful at that is, again, is another matter, but um, you know, I, I, I try to, I try to look for errors in photographs that I've taken um, or other people have taken. And, you know, if I'm there to, to take something similar, then I'll try and um, uh, remove those errors effectively. Uh, errors is probably the strong, is, is probably the wrong word, but um, uh, distractions or, or things which unbalance the image doesn't quite work, um, then, uh, then I'll try and um, improve upon that. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, I, I. But but yeah, I have I have uh, um, been influenced by uh, by one or two, um, and uh, certainly my photography um, um, would would um, evidence that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I noticed that you put a lot of emphasis on the environment in your work and you know there's quite a lot of uh yeah, I, I guess that it, it, it's hard to hard to sort of describe i guess but that that crossover between what some people call nature photography and landscape photography so where i'm talking about nature is where you're sort of getting into those more intimate uh pieces you know where it might be you know uh, the bark on a on a particular tree as opposed to a group of trees you know <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. so um in in terms of that emphasis on the environment how important is the environment to you and and expressing that as as part of your work uh, i think for anybody at this point in time in the uh, um, in uh, the human timeline, um, the environment's um, very interesting. So I, you know, I try, I, I try to consider um, my uh, photography in relation to the environment, um, and um, I, I'm not like the. I wouldn't say I'm like the friend. Um, who who would get up at three a.m. and go halfway across the country just to take one photo, you know? So, sure. so I, I tend to I, I tend to um, do my photography in in bursts, you know. Um, if you, you know, it'll be a week away somewhere. So there, there has to be there has to be a, a the the haul of images that I need to take away from a trip has to justify the um, the environmental impact of it, as far as I'm concerned. Um, be that be that um, the you know fuel used um, to to get there, um, mm -hmm. fossil fuels or whatever carbon footprint, um, but also my impact on the environment when when I'm there as well, um, leave no trace and uh, yeah. uh, and things like that. So you know from from that point of view, um, then I I certainly uh, do um, consider the environment. I also try to uh, eliminate um any evidence of um uh, obvious human um impact on the environment in my images so um I, i'm not exclusively but but i you know and some of my friends don't understand this um but i you know i don't like buildings uh, really in my images i don't like fences i don't like lamp posts or um footpaths really um I, I like it to be I, I i like to present the landscape as it would be if humans had never been there um yeah. so um yeah so so sometimes you can't do that so you do have to you know focus down on the smaller details um uh the bark on it tree or or whatever it's just picking out stuff that's 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 interesting and doesn't have that um that um human fingerprint on it yeah got it got it um i'd like to talk a little bit about you you said uh you are semi-professional uh, does that mean that you've got another job or does how, how does photography fit into your lifestyle, I guess? And do you revolve your lifestyle around photography or is it the other way around and you fit it in when you can? Um, 
it's it's the other way around at the minute. It's um it's put it in when I can. Um, uh, yeah. So so for for uh, quite a few years, I was basically offering workshops um, uh, weekends. Um, so I had a full time job, um, and then the weekends I'd be um, going off to Snowdonia or whatever, um, or I'd take a week off and run a week on workshop or something like that. So that was my using that my holiday. Um, so I, you know, turn that as semi professional. I've got a I've got a full time job which pays the bills, and then this is something on the side. Um, and uh, then um, after I after I'd my, my accident, I couldn't r- really run workshops. Um, not the types of workshops that I like to run. I mean, I could have done a workshop in a Tesco car park, but um, it, it wouldn't be me. Um, I know some people do, um, but um, I don't. Uh, so, so I'm not that on the... <laughs> No, no. Um, so uh, yeah, I, 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 I basically knocked the workshops on the head, uh, yeah. and I, I, you know, looked at other forms of. Uh, income so you know I, I've written for written articles for magazines and I've sold yep. sold the odd print here and there you know so so typical typical ways a hobbyist photographer would make uh, would make um, money from their photos and then I lost my job at the end of last year so for the last eight months I've been jobless um, mm-hmm. and that's by actually by design um, I decided that I was, you know, had a decent payout from the job. Um, now was a big time to concentrate on the photography. Yeah. And it started well. Um, I went on quite a few um, uh, trips to increase my portfolio. And uh, I've been doing some um, stuff on the digital side of things. But um, uh, I, I've also, my wife's also um, had had an incident as well so she's had an operation i've been looking after her and i actually haven't taken a photo since february so oh. what are we in now we're in july, uh, july. Um, yeah yeah so i'm actually taking you know i'm a professional photographer in inverted <laughs> commas but i haven't taken a, taken a photo for six months yeah. um but that's not unusual for me actually um i i go through occasional periods as, as a lot of people do where um Photography just takes a back seat, and yep. uh, there are other there are other things to um, uh, you know. Life takes over, as it were. I'd love to be out there taking photographs all the time, but um, wouldn't we uh, all? I, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I, you know, I think I think, a, I think a, a, a break like this, a big break, and I, I've done it when I've been you know seriously into um, uh, photography. You know, I've just stopped um, and gone away, and the. I mentioned earlier about I like I think about photographs I want to take and how I want to take them, and I find this is a good time to do that. Um, uh, I, I'll look over my old, my portfolio, um, look at ways I can have improved images, and really sort of think about that um, almost constantly, um, so that when I do eventually pick up the camera again and I go out, I I I haven't lost my eye as it were um an eye for the f- photograph and when i'm take, going to take that photo i'm considering all those things that i've been thinking about for months um so that uh, so that the image that i come out with is the best that i could do at that particular time yeah okay so in terms of i i guess keeping your personal brand awareness going during that you know the last six months how have you how have you gone about that are you just reaching back into the archive and and posting on social media occasionally or are you doing other things or you're doing nothing which is fine i'm, I'm just interested it's uh, it's <laughs> interesting yeah yeah but you basically just described my last six months going through the archive um finding hidden gems um posting uh posting occasionally i mean i've i've been really heavily into um uh, the digital side of things um oh. and web3 and stuff so so my traditional market as i would call it has kind of ebbed away um and i could see that happening 
way before I started doing anything with um, with blockchain and, and yep. uh, NFTs and things. Um, so so when that came along, it was like a, it was like a fresh start. Um, but you know, I, a lot of the people who supported me in the past still follow me on social media, will still comment on stuff. You just don't see it as much. That traditional that traditional set of people who um, are just in it to um, share and talk about photography um, and and do the odd workshop and stuff kind of like drifted away. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm trying to um, adapt going forward um, in this new era, as it were. But uh, yeah, it's it's definitely changed um, in that time. And and partly part of that is down to me, um, and part of it is another thing. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So, what's uh, I guess your uh, part of the world like? And you know, for for those that don't know, uh, you living sort of in the middle of Britain, from what I uh, what I glean. Um, you know, do you have a favourite spot nearby, or and how much is where you live right now? influenced how you shoot or are you more about getting out to as you said places like Snowdonia and the the Peak District and Lake District and and getting out and about to those more uh honeypot locations than photographing uh locally around your area yeah um the latter basically so um uh, the landscape around here does not inspire me <laughs> yeah. uh, is the best way I can put it you know I I I grew up as a kid being taken to the mountains um, by my parents. Um, I got into photography through hill walking um, and walking in the mountains and stuff. So, so that environment is what stimulates me and stimulates my creativity. But the environment around me is not in the least bit interesting. Um, for the, to, to ask me. Um, that's not to say there aren't interesting pockets. Um, so we we moved to our present location um, just under a year ago um, from Solihull, which is Birmingham, um, yep. uh, not very far away from here. But but again, not a great, not a great location. Um, uh, but needs must. Um, so I, you know, just walking the dog, I would go to the same woodland and I started to notice trees and things so so my you know I was talking earlier about how my photography has changed I've changed from sort of taking shots of mountains to taking tree woodland photography um and uh quite predominantly in recent years um and and that has just come about from just being forced with the pandemic and everything going on as well being forced to look close to home um, and there was some nice, there was some nice um, woodland where I used to live. Um, so I, I was, I, I ended up doing a lot of photography there. Um, however, since we've moved to uh, where we currently live, um, although there's some nice dog walks, they are, they are, even from a wood, woodland point of view, they are not inspiring. It's new woodland, um, you know, only, it's only been there like 10 years. There's no ancient uh, forest or anything like that. Um, oh, and no, any no, 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 oak trees, <laughs> e- exactly. And although we're on the edge of the Cotswolds, um, where there are a lot of old woodlands, um, mm. a lot of them are private, private land. Yeah. Um, so you can't you can't get onto them. You know, they're owned by the likes of you know Tom Cruise and uh, yeah, right. uh, all these people who, who are big estates. Um, so um, it, uh, unlike the Peak District or the late or, or Snowdonia, where you've got um, open access land. Um, the Cotswolds aren't like that. So uh, that, that's partly why I haven't taken a photograph um, for six months because I've not really been away um, or not been able to go away. And the landscape around here doesn't really um, inspire me. Mm. Um, having said that, <laughs> um, we seem to get absolutely amazing sunsets here <laughs> for some reason. Um, and I keep on missing them. I look out the window and I'm like, oh, that would have been really nice <laughs> if I if I just knew where to go. Um, but because I haven't been looking um, from a, you know, photography, um, photographic eye point of view, I just haven't got a clue where to go around here. Um, yeah. So, uh, 
so it's best to just go, oh, it's a nice sunset um, and forget yeah. about it. <laughs> so what's your, what's your most memorable photography experience? Good or bad? Yeah, I, I don't know. I've, I've, I've had a lot. Um, you know, I mean, the, the, the trip I mentioned earlier with um, Alex Nail, um culminated in a, um, the most amazing scene which lasted for all of you know a minute or so um and uh and that's etched out in my memory um there's been um a trip with um uh, sled dogs in um in the arctic which you know i got a couple of decent images from but that whole experience um sits in my memory of photographing um the photon or um with 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 a bunch of friends or um uh visiting uh, iceland in winter with my wife led to some um nice images so you know there's been lots of sort of uh, individual trips here and there individual moments i wouldn't say that there's any which particularly stand out from um from any other um but there's a lot of equal equal memories is the best way oh. i can put it that's fine any horror stories there's always a horror story isn't there there's always something that goes wrong um it's always every single trip every single trip out there's always something that goes wrong in some way shape or form um the worst one is is where i basically i i had an accident out on the hill um uh in 2019 um which ne necessitated a, a trip to a hospital and an operation and it's one that i haven't quite fully recovered from um mm -hmm. it's had a negative impact on um uh, other aspects of my life so um so that's that's probably that's probably the worst one um and i was out that day taking photographs um and, and the worst thing is i didn't even get a decent photograph um which which would have softened the blow um yeah. you know months later when i finally uh, downloaded the uh, the sd you know had the uh had the courage to to uh um download the sd card i was i was extremely disappointed with the results so i was like oh well not only did i have a crap day which ended up in hospital but also the the <laughs> yeah it's exactly um not even a decent photograph to show for it <laughs> you mentioned that you like to plan your shoots i guess what what does that entail and you know you're sort of conceptualizing the the image well before you get there um so that sounds to me like you you go into the field with a concept of what it is that you're you're looking for how does getting into the field change that you know because you know best best laid plans and all that sort of thing you know i i, I know i've gone out with uh, the intent of capturing you know shot x of scene y and come back with something that looks more like abc you know? yeah 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 um uh, uh, a lot of the time um i i don't set out on a trip uh, you know so say i'm say i'm um in snowdonia for example now i know snowdonia like the back of my hand um because i've been going out been going there for many years and and I went there as a hill walker and I've developed skills as a hill walker um, uh, that that I wouldn't necessarily have learned have developed um, if I'd just been there for photography from the outset right. um, so reading the weather um, understanding um, how the mountains affect affect the weather and affect the light and and all of those kinds of things. A lot of the standard stuff that you hear from um, you know dedicated mountain photographers. Um, yeah. So you know if if I don't think that um, the conditions are going to be right for um, an image, I won't bother. Um, I won't bother going up the mountain. Yeah. Um, um, and uh, you know you can read that in weather forecasts and all sorts of stuff so nice. so you know 
I've got a good idea when I set off um, whether the type of image that I'm looking for, I'm likely to get. Um, yeah. Now, you know, I can't control the weather and certain things, you know, we can't control where the cloud's going to be and whether the light's going to turn up. So there is a lot of failure in that um, because certain images in my head require light, uh, the light to be in the right place. Um, but, um, uh, you know, I'll still come away. And, and, and I guess this is why a, a lot of my images um, don't have that spectacular light in them. Um, I, you know, that, that, amazing golden um, side light um, that you get at the end of the day just doesn't appear because there's a cloud bank in the way. Yeah. Um, so, th so things haven't worked out, but um, that's, I'll still, I'll, I'll still use what other skills and tricks I've got in, in um, my bag um, to try and come up with a compelling image, image, even if that light doesn't turn up. And I think that's, you know, ultimately, um, a compelling image, it doesn't necessarily rely on light. You hear about, you know, light, um, certain photographers and well-known photographers talk about nothing but light, um, but I don't come from that stable and I don't believe in it. Um, I, I, I figure a, a compelling image should be a compelling image whether the light turns up or not, um, uh, just through your composition and, um, uh, and your approach to the story that you're trying to tell within the photograph. Mm. Um, if the light turns up, brilliant. Um, but um, it rarely does. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and when I look at my portfolio, I'd probably, I'd say maybe um, ten, less than 10% have got amazing light or have got like, you know, rainbows in them or anything like that. But a lot of them are very um, benign conditions, actually. Um, where I tried to come up with something um, that that is of interest without the spectacular going on. Yeah, fair enough. To draw the eye away, you know. Yep. So, how how many hours would you spend planning a shoot before you set off? Um. Did you say hours or minutes? Hours, minutes. <laughs> <laughs> hours. <laughs> it's probably more minutes, to be honest. Um, I don't know. I I know some guys who, uh, you know, they will they will study um, the photographers and ephemeris and um, and Google Maps and plan a shot to the nth degree, and they'll probably take hours doing so. Yeah. Um, I. I do a little bit of that. Um, my favorite tool is an OS map. Yeah. Um, I look for interesting features on an OS map um, uh, and try to picture in my mind's eye how that will look in a in a 3D real environment. Um, I don't use any additional tools for that. Um, I might look at the photographer's ephemeris to see where the sun might be on a particular day. Um, in relation to the type of image that I want to get, but that's about as far as it goes. Um, I will also look on Google um, uh, images um, to see whether a particular spot where I intend to take a photo photograph from has um, interesting aspects in the landscape. You know, are there interesting rocks at the top of that mountain, or is it just a grassy top? Um, that kind of thing. Um, so I've got a good, a fair idea of what the landscape is going to be like in which I'm standing. And I've got a good idea from the OS map um, uh, what the what the terrain in the background is going to look like as well. Um, so it's so, so, so when I say, um, you know, I, I will only go up when I think the conditions are right. I've kind of got an idea of what the what my foreground foregrounds are going to be like. I've got an idea of what my background is going to be like and I've got an idea yep. about what uh, what conditions are likely to be overhead um, before I get out of the car and can and I can do that research in the space of about five minutes. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So when when you get in the field, what's what's your routine look like there? You're obviously you know, going to hike up the mountain or up the hill and get to where you think you want to be. 
And then what? <laughs> no, normally, uh, normally um, I'm about uh, 20 minutes behind time on where I want to be. <laughs> so I'm pushing the time. Um, R- running up and uh, <laughs> trying to get the light. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and you get there and you realize, oh, no, it's not here. I want to be. I want to be half a mile over there. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, no. It's normally, <laughs> normally I'm sweating profusely, um, not very calm. It's all a panic. Um, but what what I tell what I tell people on workshops um, when I've run them in the past is when we get to a location, and I always allow a lot more time on workshops because yeah. people are always slower than 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 you think they'll be. Um, is when we get to a spot, um, it's put your back down, um, you put your tripod down and just sit down have a bite to eat have a drink and then have a little wander around um, mm. and rest and make sure that you're not in a panic yeah. um, and pl- look at what um look around you at what looks interesting what stands out um plan plan your shot for when the sun does turn up in half an hour or you know get get uh, um think about where you want to place your camera, uh, where you want to place your tripod or whatever, um, uh, way in advance of when you actually need to do it, um, rather than just be in a reactive mode. Um, so, so that's what I actually try to do um, when I'm when I'm out by myself as well. And uh, I, you know, I'll try and give myself at least twenty minutes, half an hour um, of just not doing anything, just a little wandering around and looking at the view um trying to find trying to find interesting foregrounds or whatever um and uh, and then wait for something to happen um or or not as the case may be um or look for look for things to take photos of if the light doesn't turn up if some if what you want to happen doesn't happen you know um nutting out the plan b yeah yeah i mean i've 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 been i i kind of learned um there was there was one particular memory and we're talking about memories earlier um where uh everything everything went to plan um it was the most awful day of weather it was absolutely ridiculous and i was staying up in scotland with some friends um and i said i'm going out to say i'm I'm gonna go i'm gonna drive four hours from where i am um to go and take a photo from the, from the top of a hill because I think X is going to happen. Something is going to happen. Um, I've been looking at the weather stuff and they were like, you're mad. It's absolutely throwing it down. So um, anyway, I did it. And and sure enough, I got there. I got up the mountain in plenty of time. Um, it was horrific weather. Um, and then I had to get out my little bivy, bivy bag and sit in, sit in this bivy bag for a while until the weather began to clear. And, um, and then... I had this amazing landscape and I was just listening to um, some tunes. I was there about two hours before what was going to happen happened. Um, and what I wasn't doing was I wasn't planning my shots for when the light turned up. Um, I was enjoying myself um, and I had plenty of time. Um, but when the light eventually did turn up, it was so um, so spectacular. I've never had light like it since that I was running around like a headless chicken for about five minutes um, and didn't I didn't come up with anything that was particularly compelling. Um, I got some nice images, but they weren't good images yeah. um, in that sense of the word. Um, and only in retrospect did I learn that what I should have been doing was planning all of my shots so that when the light did turn up, I knew exactly what I was doing and I would have been on autopilot to yeah, the right. images that I want. Um, and yeah, that happened. That happened like nine, ten years ago. So, so my approach since then has has um, always been to try and get to a location early uh, and plan exactly what I want to take and when I want to take it. Um, yeah. Should should conditions arise. Yeah. Okay. So you've got your your shots in the bag and uh, you've. You've got home. Are you 
sticking them on the uh, screen immediately and madly going through trying to find the bangers or are you leaving them on the card for you know a week or two and letting them gestate while you think about something else and then you come back to them i i don't understand that anybody who just doesn't process their own begin to process their images within a nanosecond of taking them um i'm i'm normally too excited there's normally one one or two that i'm no, really got. excited about yeah yeah um and i really want to process those those two don't end up being my favorites typically mm -hmm. because there'll be others that um that i will look I, i'll come back you know I, i'll do a batch process well not a batch process but i'll process a batch of them at once so sure. um um and come away and think oh I've, I've got some bangers there and then you let it stew for a little while and uh um and, and two or three weeks later you'll be just bored with nothing else to do so you'll go and have a look at the rest of the, the raw files and go oh actually that one that, that one looks nicer out. <laughs> that's the one that stands out and yeah. you'll process it and you'll take more time over the processing and um um be a bit more sympathetic or whatever um and and that and it's actually those ones that that stand the test of time rather than those those um earlier uh those earlier ones but uh but yeah i definitely i i process straight away um i i use a i've started using a, an ipad pro uh, and okay. rather than mobile um so i will literally I'll go away, like if on a week long trip, you know, I might take, I don't know, 1500 raw images and I'll mm -hmm. download all those to the iPad every night um, and process it the hell out of everything. Um, and think I've got a really great set. And then I'll come home and do it on the, the Mac um, and do it properly. Um, and not bother processing half of them because actually in that, in that intervening time, I've decided actually i don't really like that image so i'm just not yeah. I'm processing it properly um but everything else then gets reprocessed um and eventually come out with uh, um a small portfolio of images from that particular trip but many weeks down the line sure sure so on a on a portfolio image for example your average portfolio image how, how long would you spend in processing really depends um anything from between about 30 seconds to uh, an hour okay. um i'd say um heavily leaning towards the shorter time frame okay. um most i i'd say i'd say 90 percent of my portfolio i haven't spent more than three or four minutes processing wow okay. um, yeah i and and you'd be surprised at how similar the process is mm. uh, i should just do a preset and i could just apply the preset and then it'll be done <laughs> the only thing i'd have to do is clear up the dust spots maybe um yeah it, 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 all all very very similar um uh i don't really do i i don't I, i'm not the type of person who will, who will export into Photoshop and then minutely tweak individual elements and and um, okay. um, be particularly uh, what's the word um, targeted. Tar I wouldn't say I target um, elements within a photograph for individual processing. Um, mm. So I, I tend to go for a lot of more of a um a global processing approach as opposed to oh. brushes and all this kind of stuff um yeah um I, you know i'll do a little bit of dodging and burning but i'm not that accurate with it you know i i, I actually really thrive on it inaccurately um when it comes to processing yeah. um i feel i feel if you're too accurate and too too focused on individual elements then it begins to look unnatural um yeah. interesting yeah uh, to, uh, to, without without showing you an example of how i process yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it's really hard to articulate that um but i i love the inaccuracy of of lightroom um 
for that very reason, because it, it, you end up with I think, a more organic looking um, final edited image than, than you do with, with um, more uh, focused tools like Photoshop. Hmm. Okay. Fascinating. Do you do much printing in your work? Not as much as I should, maybe. Um, I do print. Um, I got a fairly decent printer. Um, I've printed for maybe four or five years, um, but I will go months without turning that print on. Um, yeah. But I, you know, I so do. You're printing, I do printing believe... yourself, you're not using a service then. No, no, I've only ever used a service a service once, and they did a great job. It was, but it was for a specific um, a, a specific requirement that I couldn't fulfil myself. Um, uh, but so so yeah, I do. I I, I print myself, um, and I, I'm I'm one of these people who doesn't think a photo is finished until it's printed. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, which basically means that, that most of my portfolio is unfinished because <laughs> <laughs> it's really expensive to print, um, yeah. and I don't, I don't like, I don't like wasting ink. Um, no. Yeah. So, uh, so, so what I prefer to do is let the let the ink rest there for six months, um, and then for it to pur have to purge itself, and therefore use probably twice as much, um, and therefore. <laughs> waste ink <laughs> <laughs> uh, fair enough fair enough well I, I guess in terms of that that process what are you I mean when when you when you're into it you your ink's been purged and you you're actually using <laughs> ink for what it's what it's designed for um are you yeah. trying to uh control sort of how that ends up looking is that why you're doing that yourself, or is it is it more just a you know a, 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 I guess a, a a branch of what you do and part of the creative process for you? I, I think yes, yeah, it's, it's controlling it, controlling the, the the final output um, is really important. So that you know, I, if I send my if I send my file to um printer a um and it's in the same file to printer b and using the right parameters the correct parameters and the um the same or very similar papers you would expect the same results um but that's not always the case no. yeah yeah it's not always the case and um you know it costs a lot of money to send uh to send files to other people to print Yep. Um, and then you've got to wait a long time for it to turn up and then it turns up and it's a bit too dark um, uh, because I've made a mistake in the file or something. Yep. Um, so uh, so I, I, I prefer to have that ultimate control so that when it does come off the printer, um, it's how I, I understand how my printer prints. I understand yep. um, how my computer um, communicates with the printer. Um, and uh i've got a good idea a very good idea of what it'll look like on the, on the type of paper that i'm using mm -hmm. um before i can before i commit to it um and uh and nine times out of ten it's completely wrong um but uh, <laughs> <laughs> no and uh, nine times out of ten it's it's it comes out okay um it's it's where i want it to be um so uh so yeah i, I prefer to have that control okay so are you, um, I, I guess, uh, uh, how much into the colour management are you getting uh, with, with your printing or are you kind of leaving that up to the, the uh, print drivers and on either the computer or the printer to, to, to manage that? Yeah. Um, I've, I've got profiles for individual papers. I yep. color manage my monitor. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, I've, I've found that actually, if you leave it up to the printer um, to figure it out itself, 99% um, of the time, it does a really good job. Um, yep. And uh, and fiddling around with it actually screws it up. <laughs> yeah, it really does. It really does. It can really affect it. Um, and uh, and so a lot of the time, I, I'll I'll not you bother using those um, those profiles. 
Yeah. Um, it depends on the image. Uh, it depends on how dark an image is, yeah, and yeah. how much black is in it, um, as to whether I'll use the profile or whether I'll just let the print, uh, uh, you know, I'll do a test print on a small piece of paper yeah. um, and see what the, what the, the printer makes of it. Um, and uh, yeah, a lot of the time the printer does a good job. Whether it's 100% accurate is a completely different matter. And I know, I know no people who, or there are people out there who um, really go into the science. Yeah, um, that's what I was of, interested of, in. Are you, uh, yeah, of, of the color management and making sure that the brown in the, in the leaves is exactly as it is on the screen. Yeah. Um, I'm like, oh, life's too short. Um, I'm not. <laughs> I, I, I'm yeah. I'm not. I'm not selling prints in volume um, or for such inflated prices that I feel, or in you know, um, really exclusive galleries that I feel that that level of accuracy um, is time well spent. Yeah. Um, uh, if if the final image that comes off the printer is you know within. Five percent, five ten percent of what it is on the screen. I'm generally happy. Um, it should look very similar with those percentages. Um, it may not be totally accurate, but like I said, there are other things to do in do in this world than yeah, I, spend I, I all my time. I get it. <laughs> working on that. <laughs> what what's your what's your favourite paper at the moment? Um, favorite paper and the paper I prefer to print on are two different things. Okay. Um, I, I, I would say my, um, favorite paper is, uh, let me just get it right. Um, uh, well, I, I use photo speed papers, um, yep. photo speed are, are, are really big in the UK. Um, and I really like the smooth cotton 300. Mm -hmm. um which is a matte paper yep. um uh i don't print on it very often though um because i actually prefer printing on a burrito um purely because i it, it is easier to print on it, you know um the colors are punchy um more often than not i can i can just send it to the printer and it'll print off almost perfectly straight away so mm -hmm. Where, where time um, and interest uh, are, are paramount, um, I would just knock it out on a burrito. So, and, you know, if I was sending a free print, if I was doing a print swap with somebody or yep. um, I had a small print sale, I would probably do it on a burrito because it's going to look good. Um, it's a good heavy paper and, um, and it looks good in a frame as long as you haven't got particularly fond of and I want to really um, get a fine print um, of it for myself or even for a customer if, uh, if there's a high value now I'll probably look to do it on a smooth cotton uh, yeah. do, it on, do it on a matte paper cool have you ever hit a creative wall and if so how did you handle it say again sorry have you ever hit a creative wall and if so how did you handle it Oh, hit a creative wall. Um, uh, yeah. Um, sorry for the long pause. I'm just like thinking how best to answer. Um, yeah. Uh, I would say that the transition uh, that I talked about earlier between taking this to the grand landscapes um, without too much thought in composition to to um, to transferring to a more considered approach. Um, I was a little I was lost in that period in between for quite a long time mm -hmm. um, because my more intimate landscapes, I'll call them intimate landscapes, but I'm talking about, you know, 
strong, big rock in the foreground kind yeah. of thing with a nice background. I I I was struggling how to do that um, for quite a long time. Um, although I was thinking about it, um, and because it took a while to transition, I think I I lost faith in my ability to do it yeah. uh, to achieve that um and uh, and i knew at the same time that i just didn't i didn't want to take the same sort of photo, the same photo as joe cornish had taken or, sure, or sure. somebody else um so uh you know i i think i at some point in that journey i probably had six months where I, again i didn't take a photograph um i think it was coming back from um, Iceland as well from that trip with Alex um, I didn't take a photograph for that was in July I didn't take another photograph until I think December that yep. year um, and that was around that time when I was trying to I was thinking about um, transitioning photography um, and uh, yeah I just didn't nothing I couldn't connect with the medium um, while I was going through this this thought process, I've done this several times though. Had these big blocks of time off, um, okay. where, as I mentioned earlier, I was thinking about it, and um, each time I think I've taken a step forward, but it has taken time for me to get there. Yeah. Um, and during that time, it's effectively a creative block. You know, I don't want to go out and take photographs. Um, I've got no interest in taking photographs during those periods of time. Um, if I went out and took a photograph, I don't even think I could be creative in my approach to the compositions. Yeah. Um, uh, I need time for it to, to connect in my brain um, before I can then be creative again. Okay, got it. What do you see as the biggest challenge facing photographers right now? There's lots. <laughs> <laughs> it's lots um uh environmental impact um yep. is one um with uh a growing unease of taking um uh you know large carbon footprint trips um just to take photographs um there's uh the Instagram generation, everybody's a photographer. Mm -hmm. um, how do you set yourself apart? How yep. do you um, maintain a uniqueness in um, in one way um, in this growing world of imagery? Um, the uh, challenge um, to the art world in terms of uh, moving from a more conventional um, um, a more conventional way of um, how do I put it uh, earning money through art and yep. you know um, prints and um, exhibitions and all that kind of stuff and this whole new world of um, digital online um, so you know nfts are uh, shaking up the art world in different ways um yep. some people think they're a waste of time some people think they're the future um two different camps two different mindsets hmm. um uh, i think and i think specifically um the you know we've had 40 odd years of using tools which were essentially the same um, in terms of how they work, you know, tactilely um, with knobs and, and all that kind of stuff using um, SLRs and then this moved us towards mirrorless cameras as well. Yeah. Um, uh, but now, you know, you're getting, you're getting devices which have got multiple lenses in them, they've got, you know, uh, instant processing and artificial intelligent processing, um, which is all pretty shoddy at the minute, but, you know, um, in time, you, you know, 
is there a point to lugging around um, two, three kilograms of equipment um, if I can get pretty much the same result off my phone? Yeah. Um, but the whole experience of taking a photograph on a phone is completely different to um, the more considered approach that you're forced to take with, um, with um, more dedicated equipment. Um, and as those phones take um, uh, become um, more and more powerful, uh, you're going to see more and more people use them in an everyday setting. There's going to be less need for the more specialised um, equipment. And although there will always be somebody willing to make that stuff, I think it's going to become harder and harder and more exclusive um, for people to get hold of uh, yeah. in time. So, uh, you know, it, if, if Canon can't sell... Um, enough cameras they're going to stop making them Absolutely. um if they can't yeah um and and so 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 yeah i think that's that's a yeah i mean it, it already it happened a while child. back with uh minolta and uh they they moved yep. into uh making photocopier parts and various other bits and pieces you know <laughs> yeah yeah it's like you know is 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 the new generation of photographers kind of coming through? Are they really going to be that interested in all this or in all these interchangeable length time cameras and things? Yeah, that, that's um, fair. You, and, see, you see those uh, guys out there with the uh, the vintage um, film cameras, you know, and developing them in various soups as well as uh, you know the the more traditional chemicals. It's uh, it, I mean it's interesting to see. I think. Uh, you know, from my perspective, the, the photography uh, creativity won't stop. Um, no. It's more around do the tools change? And I can certainly see that, you know, the writings on the wall now with the Nikon, uh, you know, saying they're no longer making DSLRs. So, you know, it won't be too long before everything's mirrorless and therefore that's the only thing on the market and therefore you know other than second hand um you know that that then becomes for me a lot closer to you know that more ubiquitous phone device anyway and you know it's it, it, it's hard to see how as you say you know with the software that is going into into the phones and the ability for them to talk to the cloud and use software on servers and bring you back an image that's been, you know, artificially intelligence uh, altered, or you know, even you know, partly generated. You uh, you end up with um, a very different photography landscape, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's there's, there's all sorts of things that are happening which are going to prove challenging for the traditional world of um, photography. Um, in terms of um, tech advances, so you know, um, you get in um, just just one other thing that actually does I do have an interest in as well. But you know, like metaverses, and, you know, uh, stuff that you may have seen in um, Ready Player One, the film a few years ago. Um, but uh, you know, you're seeing game worlds being created that are almost photorealistic now. Um, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that that um, these these um, environments will be photo realistic within five or ten years, and, and then you're like you're you're then into an area of questioning whether photography a, a photograph was taken in the real world or whether whether it was um, in a okay. computer generated. Yeah. How do you how do you differentiate the two um, when uh, when they're both, you know, photorealistic, as it were, it's going to be increasingly hard. Yeah. Um, so you'll you'll eventually have photos created that are completely artificial, and you won't be able to tell the difference. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm I'm well aware of that. I I spent some time yeah. uh, developing my Photoshop skills, actually doing screenshot art. So gaming mm -hmm. screenshots and then turning them oh, yeah. mostly into replicas of photographs so, so that you, mm -hmm. you know, in an attempt so that you couldn't quite tell, is that a photo or is that a <laughs> computer? Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, I and I think that's going to become more and more common. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it was it was a lot harder. I mean, you know, you're talking about um, me getting down to a pixel level, fixing jaggies on the edges of uh, of image, you know, of an object, you know, <laughs> which is not something that <laughs> I too much time. Like... Oh, well, I did I, at the <laughs> time. I did have too much time in my hands, or or I liked wasting it in a certain way. Anyway. <laughs> Indeed, indeed. So, uh, if, look, looking back, I guess uh, to you know, ten-year-old Greg, what advice would you give him with his Kodak Instamatic? Um, forget the photography and get a proper career. <laughs> <laughs> Follow your dreams. Become an astronaut. Um, I don't know. Um, I think uh, that's actually a really hard question. Um, I'm kind of like one of these people who I'm still deciding what I want to be when I grow up. Yeah, and I'm, yeah. 40, and I'm 45. Um, why am I 46? I can't remember. Anyway, one of the two. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I think if it has to be sort of um, photographic advice, I, 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 I and I was seeing little 10 year old Greg again, I'd, I'd say um, uh, take a little bit more interest in the, um, the history of photography mm -hmm. um, from that point on um, and get into the nuts and bolts of, of um, creating, creating photographs, not just taking snaps. Um, sure. Uh, and I'd probably advise him to take more of an interest as well in um, the likes of portraiture and, uh, uh, and, uh, and other types of photography, not just landscape, because um, uh, you're going to really struggle to make a living just in landscape. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, product photography, get into that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Start. Yeah. Well, if I'd, if I'd spoken a ten-year-old Greg, he would that would have been what 1986. Um, I'd, I'd be telling him to get into stock now, because um, <laughs> uh, you can. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because you can make a good living from it for the next fifteen years. <laughs> That's it. Uh, all right. Um, I've really only got one more question for you, and it's uh, for some people the most important question that I ask on the podcast. Do you like pineapple okay. on pizza? <laughs> Do I like pineapple on pizza? Oh my God. Um, this, uh, this is a divorceable question um, <laughs> in our house. Um, my wife likes pineapple on pizza, um, but it's a goddamn fruit, and fruit does not belong on a pizza, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah. So, no, firmly, no. <laughs> Very good. Well, it's a, another one for the nose. Uh, so far, it's been fairly even uh, throughout the podcast. How is it? I think this is uh, people like episode fifty-four. So uh, okay, yeah, it's it's, it's probably oh, yeah. one for one. It's it's just weird. It's weird. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me, Greg. It's been really great to get to know you. Um, and you know learn a lot more about how you do what you do uh where can people find your work uh they can find my work at oh, my my website seriously needs updating but they can find it at www.gregwhitten.com um you could also follow me on twitter at uh, g Whitten, uh, photo um and uh yeah that's actually the most the, the, the two areas where i i'm, I'm most active um so if anybody wants to um, have a chat, just find me a, a DM on Twitter or something like that. Quite happy to answer questions or just uh, chat about all things photography. All right, brilliant. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks again for listening to Landscape Photography World. I hope you enjoyed the show and keep listening because I'll be joined by some great guests in upcoming episodes. You can find my work in this podcast at grantswinburnphotography.com. I'm also on Instagram, Twitter, YouTube and Facebook. I'm Grant Swinburne. Hope to see you out shooting soon.